Some say the issue of immigration reform has also taken a nasty turn in our society. One reason might be lack of understanding and confusion in terms of what's going on and why. Joining me in the studio to share their understanding and perspectives on the issue at hand is Wes Renfro, associate professor and chair of the Department of Political Science and Legal Studies at St. John Fisher College. Josh Apo, a Haitian refugee, now U.S. citizen, who released an inspiring memoir last year about his journey called Gold from the West. Well. And Jim Morris, Associate Vice President for Family Services at Catholic, Catholic Family Center. And welcome to all of you. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Wes, from news reports and tweets uh, from the president to protests and press conferences, we have heard a lot over the last several months about Dreamers and DACA and so on. So for viewers watching right now and they're thinking, what is going on with all of this and what is happening in Congress and with immigration, this whole tie-in, this budget issue? How would you break this down? Just school us, break us down, what's happening, why? Yeah, so there's about 11 million undocumented immigrants in the country, a smaller proportion, about 2 million, 1.8 million, are what we call the dreamers, and a smaller proportion yet have applied for a specific program called DACA. These are folks who are brought here as children, they are fully employed or are veterans or have some other credentials and no criminal history. There's long been a push to give them a path to citizenship. Um, unfortunately, in the past several months, the uh, DACA program has gotten tied up with politics, as, as this, the congressman suggested and now um, it's being held hostage to larger issues. What I think is very interesting to me is that large majorities of Americans, both conservative and liberal, support the DREAM Act. They want these people to have a pathway to citizenship. It's low-hanging fruit, but it hasn't happened yet. Well, I want, in terms of this pathway to citizenship and what the DREAM Act would, would provide, what exactly would that be? So it depends on the specific proposal, but it means that if you've been here and you have credentials and you're fully employed, over a path of anywhere from seven to perhaps 12 or even up to 15 years, you can obtain uh, the paperwork and then eventually the uh, up direct pathway to citizenship. Well, Josh, in the short time that we have today, yes. and I apologize because I will not do your story justice, uh, but in short, I will tell viewers to get your book, Gold from the Well, yes. um, but in Thank short, you. 1980, you're 20 years old. You survived a more than two-week journey from Haiti to the U.S. by boat, I should say by raft. Mm -hmm. um, and when you got here, I want to read something uh, that you wrote in your book in regards to when you first got to the U.S. Yes. And you said, God bless the American people. I say that with all my heart. If they wanted to keep this country to themselves, then they can do it. Then today, I would not be here talking to you. I read that because in light of everything that's going on in our country right now in regards to immigration, I wonder what concerns you, uh, what worries do you have um, for others who come here and, and seek refuge, but unlike you, the promise of staying here is, is not necessarily a promise. Well, at first, let me say to you, I'm very sorry. When I hear this, I get emotional. And last week, President, Clinton, uh, President Bush said something about uh, refugees from Haiti and Africa and a lot of different, different, yes, mm -hmm. President Trump. And I have seven year old, she came up to me, said, Daddy, he's talking about you. I said, okay, baby, no, don't worry about it. And my wife come next to me, we're talking about it, and it went a little bit emotional. And I have a lot of friends come to me, tell me that, you know, they're sorry that, you know, they say, they talk like that. I came here in this country, like you say, in 1980. I work hard. And I love American people. And I like that they welcome me and I take a chance in the water to come here. And I came here, I work hard. I didn't know anything about welfare, anything like that for me to go get anything to support me. I work for what I need. And because this country is such a good country, American people are such a wonderful people, I'm always pray for God to bless them all the time. And for those who have a bad idea about this country to do something arm to arm United States, that doesn't feed everybody who come here for the same reason. Some of us come here simply to have a better life. Not to destroy, not to go look for fire or killing, do anything we're not supposed to do. And that's why I came here in this country. And I love American people. I will always continue to love American people no matter what. 
with this immigration conversation that we're talking about and we're hearing. We're talking about DACA. We're talking about Dreamers. Um, and then there's refugee resettlement. And, and the latter being something, Jim, that you believe is getting lost in the midst of some of these competing priorities with the immigration conversation. What's happening with refugee resettlement in the midst of everything? And how are we feeling it in Rochester? Sure. Well, refugee resettlement doesn't seem to be part of the, the current immigration debate going on in Congress right now. But, but what we're seeing um, as resettlement agencies is the, the dismantling of the refugee resettlement network uh, here in Rochester and across the country, where once here in Rochester, we resettled up to 1,000 refugees. And this fiscal year, we'll only resettle maybe 300. And it seems to be uh, the administration's uh, measures seem to be sort of like a death by a thousand cuts to the resettlement program. We see overt actions like the 120-day refugee ban that was in effect last year. We see a reduction of refugee admission numbers from 110,000 nationally to 45,000. But we are, we're also witnessing some uh, less conspicuous me measures that are happening overseas the processes that put refugees in the queue to come here, like uh, interviews with Department of State, uh, background checks, screenings, identification of vulnerable refugees. So all that has been, been halted or um, neglected. So we've gone from a country that welcomes 110,000 refugees to a country that promises to resettle 45,000, but in actuality, we're on track to resettle less than 20,000. I want to share something from a producer from Mountain Lake PBS, and uh, he recently worked on a story that really put a human face on the immigration issue, and uh, specifically for immigrants fleeing the United States to seek asylum in Canada. Uh, and this is in light of the, temp the uh, termination of temporary protected status uh, for a number of immigrants. So he followed U.S. and Canadian citizens um, who are working to help these individuals uh, in their journey across the northern border. So I want to share just a short clip um, from his piece. It is illegal to come to Canada by this way. You have to report yourself to customs. It's about 10 kilometers from here. If you cross by here, you're going to be arrested by a police officer. Most of them know they will be arrested. And that's a scary thing, I think, for anybody to do under any circumstances. But if you consider that many of these people um, are actually um, asylum seekers who themselves may have experienced all forms of repression, persecution in their home countries, uh, they may have been imprisoned, tortured, that for them to take such a step is particularly difficult and frightening because of their past experiences. I know some of them are still documented, but they're fearful of remaining in the U.S. Some are not documented, their visas have run out, and so they feel that they would have a better chance if they went to Canada. Because of the political climate after the election, immigrants felt that they were no longer welcome in the United States. What the Trump administration has done, according to my understanding, is to expand measures that were already in place. The numbers of people being picked up, undocumented people being picked up and going through these expedited removal procedures has considerably expanded. Most of them come by Greyhound bus through New York City. They come into Plattsburgh, usually at the bus station, and they call a cab. Um, and then they take a ride up to, generally, to the Roxham Road. And then they start that process. The cabs, the cabs pull into this area right here and they unload, and then the crossing is right here. The log that's pitched to the side right there, that's the, that's the border, that's the line. Um, and if any of us cross there, we will be arrested. When they climb out of that taxi, all they want to do is run across the border. I've had people ask me, are they going to beat me up as I cross? And I say, no, no, they're not going to beat you up but they're very, very fearful. So the last thing on their mind is to tell someone their story. A lot of it is because of the Third Safe Country Agreement, which means that you must claim asylum in the first country you land in. So their first country has been the US. So they can't then go to Canada and at the regular crossing and say, hey, 
I want asylum in Canada now. Refugees or asylum seekers as they really are, are, are not the problem. The real problem we face in the world is the causes of refugee movements. If you look at uh, what's happening right now in Yemen or Syria or South Sudan, places where terrible armed conflicts are taking place, it's those factors that are pushing people out of their own countries and you know, trying to seek protection elsewhere that are the real problem, not the refugees and asylum seekers themselves. NBC recently reported that uh, those with temporary protected status, they are trying to make sure that their voices are mobilizing efforts to make sure that their voices are heard uh, in this immigration negotiations. And I want to know, you mentioned we're not hearing anything and nothing's on the table with refugee resettlement right now with the immigration talks. Wes, is, is there anything that we are not discussing, the news is not covering in relation to this that we should be or that we should be aware of? Yeah, I think the conversation thus far is really focused on criminality and on economics and on demographics. And we know the answers to those questions. I think what we're not talking about are questions of assimilation, of culture, of values, because those are harder and more fraught discussions to have. And so we have this back and forth about the numbers, but we actually know the role that immigrants play in the economy, for example. And I think we do that because we are not comfortable having real, honest discussions about values and, and the role that immigrants play. Josh, when yes. you watch the news, when you hear what's going on, you said you've had mm -hmm. conversations with your family. Yes. Do you believe that there is misinformation or wrong representation, some of which Wes just said, that you would like to address? Yes, they are to me wrong and misrepresented because as a way, we, as a lot of people around the world believe in the United States. They love the United States. And for all of a sudden, this country has been here for almost 200 something, maybe 250 years since this country has been here, and people have been coming to this country. There was a time this country used to go, all the country bring people here to do work, to do migrant work, different type of work before they even have a machine. Now, if you wanted to do it, America, I know, we're going to do it right way, and it's going to take some time. It's not going to be done overnight. It's a lot of people have a lot of different opinions, which is good. That's making it interested. Maybe that's why we're here today. But if you really believe in God, and you really, America, as I know, I take my chance in the water to come here, you're going to have to take some time to do it, and then America can do it. And those people who risk their life, some of them even take a chance, lost their family members, sell everything they got in their own house to make it here and for you to just tell them turn around, go back home with nothing, it's, it's going to be a lot of, lot of crisis that uh, we won't be able to, um, to describe until it really happened then it'd be too late. This misinformation aspect, yes. uh, I want to ask you too about this, Jim, because this is something you've talked, you, Wes touched upon the economic factor of it, and, and this is something that you say people don't understand. They think that when you put a cap on refugees and limit them or cap on the number of immigrants allowed into the country, um, people say, well, this will, there are some who argue that this would be a better benefit to us economically, but that ne necessarily is the case. Is that correct? Right. I think there's a lot of economic evidence that refugees and immigrants are a boon to uh, economies, uh, local economies and communities. We have businesses that we've worked with for years at Catholic Family Center that are asking us, where are the refugees? They have uh, labor gaps that need filling and historically uh, refugees have come and, and filled a lot of jobs here in, Re in Rochester. Well, we will have to close for now, but I want to thank all of you uh, for joining me and for sharing your insight and your perspectives today with our viewers. To learn more about the services and support through Catholic Family Center, go to cfcrochester.org. And be sure to pick up a copy of the incredible true story of Joshua Poe. His memoir is called Gold from the Well, and you can find it on Amazon.com.